Hi, and welcome to Chapter 5. Uh, this chapter is really a continuation of Chapter 4. We're going to look at equilibria in the marketplace uh, in Chapter 5. Last chapter, we took a brief excursion into elasticities, but here we're back onto supply curves, demand curves, and equilibria. And really, we're going to look at the three main things that affect equilibria. And these three things are price ceilings, price floors, and taxes. So we're going to use the supply and demand curves to analyze each of these things. Please memorize these two definitions right here. What is a price ceiling and a price floor? One and two. OK, so let's look at the market for apartments. This is a rental price of apartments, a quantity of apartments. Remember, price always goes on the vertical axis. Quantity always goes on the horizontal axis. Uh, this is always the way you draw your curves. Demand goes down, supply goes up, and we have an equilibrium. Now notice I have this written as without price controls here because this is just exactly the same way as we did it back in chapter four. Um, but now I'm going to introduce a price control. I'm going to introduce something called a price ceiling. This is a non-binding price ceiling because look, the price naturally wants to be at 800. The government says that $1,000 is the maximum amount. And just to make it clear to you, a price ceiling is something that says the price can be at the ceiling or below. This is all the legal region for prices under the price ceiling. Any price up here is illegal. Well, as we can see, this $800 price right here is definitely within the legal region. It is not in the illegal region. So this price ceiling doesn't affect the price. That's known as not binding. Okay. However, let's imagine that we have a price ceiling that is binding. As you can see, now $800 is in the illegal region, which is all of this region up above here. The region below the price ceiling, this is the legal region, and it is not where the price is located. So the price is going to be affected. So let's see what that's going to do. Uh, it's called a binding constraint, and there's going to be a shortage. Just because people want 400 uh, units to live in, only 250 will end up being built. Okay. In, oops, in the long run, supply and demand are even more price elastic. We learned that last chapter, which means the shortage is going to be even bigger. That's a big problem. So sellers must ra ration the goods among buyers. So there's really no good mechanism for dividing up the few number of houses amongst all of the people that want the house. So sometimes there's long lines, or sometimes there's outright discrimination. All right. So uh, this is a problem because when prices were not controlled, we were able to have everybody who desired a house wanted a house. OK, let's look at the market for unskilled labor. Now, I just want you to see that uh, in this marketplace, uh, something a little weird. Instead of having price on the uh, y-axis, I have wage. But if this is the marketplace for people who are workers, L is the quantity of people who are going to work, and wage, that's the price of a worker because that's how much you have to pay the worker. So this is really the exact same price um, supply and demand graph that we've always seen. OK, so the demanders, these are the people um, who want workers. So these are like companies. And this is the suppliers. This is the people who supply workers, that is households. OK. And let's say that this is there's an equilibrium wage. $6 is the price of a worker. It's their wage. And there's 500 people who work. Everything is in equilibrium. Everybody who wants to work has a job. However, let's say there's a price floor. OK. Recall what price floors mean. Price floor means that the price cannot go below it. So this is the illegal region. This is the OK region. In this example, we have a price in the OK region which means that it is not binding. However, the more interesting effect is when we do make a price floor. You might recognize this as called a minimum wage. Okay, This is going to say that the $6 equilibrium wage is too low. Um, at the higher price, 400 people want workers because they can't really hire as many as they wanted to before. Before, remember, they demanded 500. Now they're only demanding 400. But more people want to work, so there's this short, uh, excuse me, surplus. There's too many laborers, not enough jobs for everybody. And the binding constraint 
causes unemployment. That's what a labor surplus is called in the labor market. Okay, so the minimum wage worker, the minimum wage law does not affect highly skilled workers. It does affect you as a teenage worker or as a college uh, worker before you become highly skilled college uh, degree holder. Okay, and it does cause unemployment. Let's go ahead and do this example. I want you to de determine the effects of a price ceiling and a price floor and two price floors actually in the market for hotel rooms. Do this on your handout and then when you're all done, click play and I'll give you the answers. All right, so a $90 price ceiling. This is binding. So the price falls to $90, okay, as you see, and there's a shortage. Really, there's only 100 and or excuse me, 90 hotel rooms being supplied. So what's the equilibrium here? Well, the quantity is 90 and the price is 90. But Look how many more people want hotel rooms. So there's a lot of people who don't get hotel rooms. So there's a shortage. Let's do a $90 price floor. Remember, a price floor means the price cannot go below. So this is the illegal region for a price floor. Well, this is the okay region. The price is in the okay region. Therefore, this is not binding. It's not illegal. And if there's a price floor that is too high, now the price is, the equilibrium price is in the illegal region, and what's the supply? Well, you see, all these people, the hotel makers, want to sell a lot of hotel rooms, 120 in fact, but because they're so expensive, only 60 people can afford to buy them. Okay, so there's all these extra hotel rooms left over. So we ask ourselves a question, are these price controls a good idea? At first glance, one person might think that they are, but as you can see, price floors and price ceilings either are unbinding, or if they are binding, they cause surpluses and shortages. Let's go to the final um, thing we're gonna talk about this lecture is taxes. All right, so taxes are inevitable. The government levies them and it uses them to pay for goods uh, that are public goods, all right? And we're only going to analyze per unit taxes, which is a tax per unit. So here is the market for pizza. We have our price and quantity curves labeled correctly, supply and demand curves as well. And we have an equilibrium made up of a P and a Q. Let's imagine that a $1.50 unit tax on buyers. That means every pizza is made uh, $1.50 $1 more expensive. So in order to make the people still buy 500 pizzas, because recall, you see, they're only going to spend $10 for 500 pizzas. But if they're going to have to spend $1.50 per pizza on top of that, you need to make the pizza plus the tax. It cannot be end up being more than $10. So this is the same as sliding the demand curve down by $1.50. Okay? So look at this new demand curve. This is what it feels like to the buyers when they have to pay a $1.50 tax because they won't pay more than $10 total. So the new demand curve looks like it's at $8.50 and $500. And this happens at every price point. All right. Um, this new equilibrium now is the intersection of the two curves. The price that the sellers pay is $9.50. The price the buyers get is $11. I want you to see that there's this gap from here to here. And remember the gap from here to here is the height of the tax, $1.50, okay? So even though the people are paying $11, okay, the sellers are only getting $9.50, but it is an equilibrium because 450 pizzas are being bought and sold. And now look, I told you earlier in chapter four that an equilibrium had price and quantity. Equilibrium with taxes now has two prices to report price of the buyer paying and price the seller's getting along with the quantity. So equilibria with taxes, you have to tell me three different numbers. And then of course, this number here, this $1.50 goes to the government and they get it 450 times $1.50. So this rectangle right here is the revenue from or to the government. All right, so what I want you to think of is how, who actually has to 
pay the tax, not who gets charged the tax. That is um, here we're talking about if the buyer gets charged the tax, but who, who, who actually feels it more? Who does the tax hurt? Okay, so if you can see, the buyers they have to pay a dollar more and the sellers get 50 cents less. So even though the tax is a dollar fifty and the buyers are paying a dollar fifty of tax to the government, right? They're only feeling a dollar of it because it's getting a dollar more expensive to them. And I want you to look at this word, it's known as the incidence of the tax. So if I ask you what is the incidence of the tax or the burden of the tax, I don't want to know which party is paying the tax. I want to know how much it quote hurts each individual. All right, so now let's pretend that the sellers have to pay $1.50 tax. So what's this gonna do? That's gonna make the supply curve shift back by $1.50. Now think about this, this makes perfect sense. In order to still make 500 pizzas, we know that the suppliers have to get $10 to make 500 pizzas. But if they're also gonna have to pay a tax of $1.50 to the government, that means actually they're gonna need to get $11.50 at 500 in order that they're left with $10 at 500, okay? And the difference between them is the tax. So let's look at the new equilibrium, 450 and $11. And then how much do the sellers get? Well, they get the $11 minus the tax, which is 950. The distance is the tax. I want you to see that this is the exact same in both cases, all right? So the best way to analyze a tax is actually to realize that it doesn't matter who actually pays the tax the, the uh, supplier or the demander, the buyer or the seller, it doesn't matter at the end of the day who sends the check to the government. The only thing that matters is who gets hurt more or what the incidence is. From here to here is the incidence of the tax on the buyer and from here to here is the incidence of the tax on the seller. The best way to analyze tax is just to take the old supply and demand curve Find a, get a line that's $1.50 long or however much the tax is and I just want you to slide it in boop, until it hits the demand curve. Slide it in until it hits the demand curve and then that will give you your new quantity and then your new prices which are equilibrium. Remember an equilibrium with taxes includes two prices and a quantity. All right, so just slide the tax wedge in there and you don't even have to redraw any curves for tax analysis. Let's do this right here. So suppose the government imposes a tax of $30. I want you to do this and then hit play when you're all done. And we're gonna slide it $30 tax wedge just in there. Boom, there's, there's this $30 slid on in there and that gives us our new quantity and our new price, okay? If I had asked you for the, equal, the old equilibrium price it's right here. The new one is right here, okay? So you can tell me what happens. Well, the buyers, they have to pay $10 more than they would have originally, right? The buyers pay this extra because they would have been paying right here, $100. So the buyers have to pay this extra. The sellers pay or lose this extra. They pay that much extra of the tax. So it doesn't matter who's actually writing the check to the government. The incidence of the tax in this case is $10 for buyers and $10 for sellers. All right, so let's see what happens when supply is more elastic than demand. Remember that is, as is the slope of the supply curve decreases, meaning the supply curve gets flatter, it looks more um, elastic. So let's throw this tax wedge in there and you can just see geometrically who gets hurt more, right? This is the incidence of the tax on the buyers. This is the incidence of the tax on the sellers. And it's because of the slope of this supply curve that's, that's making this be uneven now, all right? So you have these different shares of the tax burden. So the person with the more elastic demand curve, excuse me, curve, the more elastic curve is this one right here, they're better off. And the reason why is this right here, because it's easier for buyers to leave. Elasticity means that as you change the price, the quantity changes. So they get out of the market really quickly. The buyers, however, it's inelastic, meaning they have to buy it always. It's very hard to leave the market and they get stuck paying the tax. Let's now think about demand being more elastic than supply. Okay, so we have a nice steep supply curve because it's inelastic. 
the tax burden now is more on the seller. The person with the inelastic curve, inelastic supply curve here, whatever one is more up and down, they get hurt more by the tax. They bear more tax incidence. All right. So here's a, a little idea. I want you to think about it. In there's this thing called the luxury tax on very expensive goods, and the the idea the government had was to charge tax to wealthy consumers. Well, we want to actually see who is quote hurt more by the tax or who bears more of the incidence of the tax. All right, let's imagine that the demand is price elastic. This is very true. Um, luxury yachts are a luxury good, so as the price changes, people are going to say, hey, I'm not going to buy so many, so many luxury yacht, yachts. However, supply is very inelastic. A boatyard takes a long time to build, and it's not easy to change the quantity of boats that are being produced. All right, so here's the old equilibrium, and there's the new equilibrium with the price. Look at this. Who ends up paying more of the tax? The sellers end up paying more of the tax. This is the boat makers. This is not the people purchasing the boat. Congress tried to get a little bit extra revenue from the consumers, the people who had the extra money. They ended up hurting the sellers, the people who were creating it. All right, so here's another uh, final question for you. Okay, we have a tax change in the Social Security payroll taxes. Okay, I want to. I'm going to draw a supply and demand curve here. Okay, so here's what we're looking at: the total tax wedge right there used to be at 12.4 percent, and then it reduced it to what's 4.2 plus 6.2 is. 10.4%. So this tax wedge got smaller. In other words, it's like drawing a smaller tax wedge right here. So now what I want to know is what's the difference between PB and PS and in both cases. Okay, so you can see very clearly that PB goes down and PS goes up a little bit. All right? And so that's the answer or that helps you answer this question. All right, so as long as labor supply and labor demand both have a price elasticity of greater than zero, the tax cut will be shared by both workers and employees. Just like I showed in the previous screen, the PB and the PS both move in a little bit. Okay, who gets the bigger share of this tax cut, workers or employers? Now this time elasticity does matter. The person, remember, with the more elastic curve, whoever has a more elastic curve is better off. Okay? The inelastic curve always ends up paying more tax. So here's a conclusion about uh, the what happens to the marketplace 